Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our time of worship at Berlin Christian Church. We're glad that you joined us on, here in, uh, in person, and those of you online, we welcome you. Uh, today, if you'd uh, like to check in with us or if you have any prayer requests, we invite you to uh, use our, um, our um, text line um, to uh, say hello, or if you have any prayer requests, um, to, uh, to give to us the, the numbers in your, in your bulletin here today. And so we just invite you to connect with the church in that way, and we'd love to be praying for you and, um, <clears throat> and uh, just sharing life together as, uh, as a body of Christ. Uh, so today I want to invite Jack to come and read some scripture for us and uh, hear the word of the Lord. Good morning, church. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jack Natmeyer. For those of you who do know me, my name is still Jack Natmeyer. <laughs> it's a terrible joke. <laughs> I'll be reading from Psalm 86. Bend down, O Lord, and hear my prayer. Answer me, for I need your help. Protect me, for I am devoted to you. Save me, for I serve and trust you. You are my God. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I am calling on you constantly. Give me happiness, O Lord, for I give myself to you. O Lord, you are so good, so ready to forgive, so unfit full of unfailing love for all who ask for your help. Listen closely to my prayer, O Lord. Hear my urgent cry. I will call to you whenever I'm in trouble, and you will answer me. N no pagan god is like you, O Lord. None can do what you do. All the nations you made will come and bow before the you, Lord. They will praise your holy name, for you are great and perform wonderful deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may live according to your, your truth. Whoops. Grant me purity of heart so that I may honor you. With all my heart, I will praise you, O Lord, my God. I will give glory to your name forever. For your love for me is very great. You have rescued me from the depths of death. O God, insolent people rise up against me. A violent gang is trying to kill me. You mean nothing to them. But you, O Lord, are God of compassion and mercy, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love and happiness. Look down and have mercy on me. Give your strength to your servant. Save me, the son of your servant. Send me a sign of your favor. Then those who hate me will be put to shame. For you, O Lord, help and comfort me. Amen. So I invite you to stand as we worship today. And uh, as we, uh, I was just thinking about reflecting on the, uh, the, the eclipse that we just uh, experienced last or earlier this week. And uh, just how God has been so amazing and how he has designed the universe that the, the sun is the right distance from the earth and the moon the right distance from the earth and just the right size to be able to create the effect that we saw uh, at, during the eclipse. That it, if the moon had been a little bigger, we would have had hours of darkness. And if the moon had been a little smaller, just been a little dot flo floating across the sun, we'd have never even noticed it. But God has, create, has uh, created all creation so that we could uh, see his glory and, uh, and see... The, the, the great love that he has for us. Uh, so we'll just sing together of his name. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea, creation's revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring, every creature unique in the song that it sings, all exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name, you are amazing God. All-powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, you are amazing God. Who has told every lightning bolt where it should go? Or oh, seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow? 
who imagined the sun and gives source to its light, yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night. None can fathom indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing God. All powerful, untamable, all struck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing God. You are amazing God. Indescribable, uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing God. Incomparable, unchangeable, you see the depths of my heart and you love me the same. You are amazing God. Oh, you are amazing, God. You are amazing, God. Man, let's give praise to our amazing God who has created such a wonderful place for us. God is 
for us. But who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Then what could stand against? to the God of the universe. We honor him. As morning dawns and evening fades, you inspire songs of praise that rise from earth to touch your heart and glorify your name, your name is a strong and mighty tower, your name is a shelter like no other, your name. Let the nation sing it louder, as nothing has the power to sing but your name. Jesus is Is a shelter like no other, your name. Let the nation sing it louder, cause nothing has the power to save but your name. It's your name. Is a strong and mighty tower, your name. Is a shelter like no other, your name. Let the nation sing it louder, cause nothing has the power to save. It's your name. Is a strong and mighty tower, your name. Is a shelter like no other, your name. Let the nation sing it louder, cause nothing has the power to save but your name. Amen. Jesus' name we give praise. God, we honor you and give thanks to you. Glorify your name today. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, church. 
beautiful day he's given us. Seems like a good day to celebrate our history and go for a walk. <laughs> this month's uh, mission partner, we're praying for Pioneer Bible Translators. And one of the main missions of Pioneer Bible Translators is to translate the Bible or parts of the Bible into unreached people groups, their main or native language. Still today, there are over 2,000 known languages, language groups who do not have God's word translated into their language. Um, the mission of PBT is to bring the gospel to all people. And in particular, uh, Berlin Christian Church supports Alex and Lauren Follett and their beautiful family, and they are currently serving um, with groups in West Africa. Uh, Alex and Lauren have asked for us to be praying for language learning as they serve and Alex also informed us that he slipped a disc in his back and has asked for prayers for healing and strength for his wife, Lauren, as she shoulders the load uh, while he hopefully gets healthy. And uh, they have sent a video that we'll watch and you'll see um, what that load looks like for them. Um, so as a church family, it's essential that we recognize other believers as brothers and sisters. Uh, we are all part of God's family. And being a part of that family, we should always seek uh, ways to help others and serve joyfully. And God's family works best when we're working together. Uh, we see this in the book of Acts, uh, the early church, as they united with fellow believers. So I'll read from Acts 2, 42 through 47. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who was in need. Every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And because of that, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So we are going to pray together and ask our good and faithful Father to bless this offering. And then I would ask um, that you sit, shift your attention to the screen, um, and we have a video to share from Alex and Lauren. Let's pray. Father God, you are so good to us. Please bless this offering so that it may help share the good news of your son, Jesus, and bring people to your spiritual family. Please strengthen us to resist only concerning ourselves and our own interest but instead seek ways to serve others and help others both in our community and around the world. We pray for this mission, Bible, Bible, Pioneer Bible Translators, as well as our partners, Alex and Lauren Follett. Be with them as they aim to further your kingdom and bring your word to those who do not have it. Lord, we just ask you to bless this church so it's a place that attracts others to faith in Jesus. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Berlin Christian Church, happy birthday. 200 years, that is incredible. Um, I just wanna make this video to say congratulations. How did you wanna say congratulations? Or happy birthday? Happy birthday. Yes. <laughs> 200 years, that's amazing. Uh, we're the Follets, we serve in West happy Africa. Happy birthday. Alex, Julia, Addie, Isabel, and Lauren. Mm. And we love you guys. We're so thankful for everything that you're doing. Um, please know that you're making a huge impact, not just in Central Illinois, but around the world as well. So one last time, congratulations on 200 years. And if Jesus doesn't come back soon, here's the 200 more. All right, love you guys. <laughs> So I invite you to uh, turn your hearts towards our time of communion today. <clears throat> I'll be reading from Mark 15, 39 for our uh, communion meditation. So when the centurion who stood opposite him, being Jesus, saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. A Roman centurion, <clears throat> I'm sorry, centurions were either junior or middle grade officers in the army. They typically were command, in command of 80 soldiers. Se senior centurions could lead a, a cohort of up to 1,000 men. 
and executions were usually carried out by a group of soldiers called lictors under the command of a centurion. These men were career officers, hardened military men who carried out their orders without question. They must have wondered about their duty that day. They understood the punishment of two men who were being executed. They were thieves who may have been involved in an insurrection. But the third victim was a curiosity. He had committed no crimes. He was delivered to them because of envy of the corrupt religious leaders in Jerusalem. Knowing Jesus was a righteous man, the centurion and the soldiers with him came to believe that he was the Son of God. Two things led them to this conclusion. First, Jesus cried out with a loud voice just before he died. Victims of crucifixion typically lapse into unconscious state before they breathe their last. But Jesus was strong enough to cry out loudly. It seemed unnatural. They could only conclude that he was who he claimed to be, the Son of God. And second, they witnessed the earthquake and other supernatural phenomena that occurred immediately following Jesus' death. When those things occurred, it made it very fearful, it made them very fearful, and they led them to believe that he was indeed the Son of God. And I also kind of think back to uh, that there was darkness from 12 o'clock till 3 o'clock in the afternoon the day that Jesus died too, and it's like, Maybe that was an eclipse. We don't know. It's not been recorded. And I don't know if the scientists have looked that up, but that one's for free. Uh, testimony like that from those who carried out Jesus' execution should lead us to conclude that they were right. Jesus w was and is the Son of God who laid down his life on the cross to save us from our sins. We have been accepted into the family of God because of our faith in Jesus and our obedience to the word. Let us rejoice in our salvation as we partake in the Lord's Supper. At Berlin Christian Church, we practice open communion, which means that if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're welcome to share with us. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Holy God, we are uh, thankful today for your sacrifice, but also for the power of the resurrection that has uh, made us come to believe that you are the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and the Savior of our hearts. As we share in this meal together today, God, we remember and we celebrate together what you have done and the love that you have shown us. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
Well, Jesus loves you. We love you too. It's good to worship Jesus with you today. We're going to be celebrating our uh, bicentennial uh, some more this, uh, after church. I'll give you some of those instructions uh, at the end of the gathering today. But I want to practice our memory verse, okay? Our 200th anniversary. I even got, got it over here for you. It's Hebrews 13, verse 8. You guys remember the signs, okay? So Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's from Hebrews 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the first part of our, our year so far, we, we were camped out in the Gospel of John. We were talking about Jesus Christ. Now, Every sermon you hear from Berlin Church should be about Jesus Christ, but we really focused on the gospel story about Jesus. And so last week, Michael kicked off our next series right now, which is the same. What are some things that have been, are the same uh, from, from the beginning, essentially? And so we're looking at God's heart from Exodus 34. So I want to invite you to go ahead and get your Bibles ready to Exodus 34. After we finish this series here in a few weeks, uh, we're going to talk. Uh, we're going to have a parent-child dedication. We're going to give you some instructions on that also before you leave. And then the summer months, we're going to talk about yesterday, and we're going to talk about a 200-year section of history in the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible. And so we're looking forward to that. And then before we finish our anniversary year, uh, we're going to talk about uh, today, which will be the. Um, we're going to look at the Book of Acts and kind of how the church was, you know, still the same as it is today. And so, kind of give us some marching orders for today, and then we'll close with forever by looking at the Book of Revelation at the end of of this year. Lord willing, unless Jesus comes back, which would be great. So, I invite you to uh, uh, Exodus chapter thirty four. Exodus thirty four. We're going to be in a handful of those sections of verses in Exodus those middle chapters. But I have good news for you. The Lord looks with favor on us even when we don't deserve it. The Lord looks with favor upon us even when we don't deserve it. Uh, some of you have read this book by James Bryan Smith called The Good and Beautiful God. And in this book, he tells a story of preaching on, on this theme, the love of God, how God is gracious and compassionate and how he loves without condition. And he was kind of nervous because some preachers, I'll be honest, some preachers reuse their sermons. And so he was preaching the same sermon, basically, with this church. Uh, a few years earlier, he'd visited and preached it. And so he was a little nervous that maybe people would remember the sermon. And so one guy came up, and he kind of had a copy of that sermon. He said, I was here five years ago when you preached this sermon. He kind of thought, I've been found out. But he says, no. He said, that sermon on the love of God, how, love, how God loves us without conditions, changed my life. He said, I grew up in a very legalistic church, and I just felt like God was always mad at me. And when I heard that message about how God loves me without any condition, it changed my life. And I've made copies of this. I've shared this with everyone I come. I just came today to say thank you. And so he's like, I'm a law enforcement guy. We don't really cry. And he had tears in his eyes, and he just had that moment with James Brian Smith. They hugged one another, and James was just thankful that the love of God changes people's lives. And so that's what we're walk, walking through this text here in Exodus 34, 6, and 7, where we just learn about who God is, his heart. Last week, Michael talked about how the Lord, the Lord is compassionate. Today, we're going to look at this theme, he's gracious. Next week, we'll talk about slow to anger. Then we'll close with he's abounding in love and then faithfulness. So there's where we're going to be the next few weeks. And so what I want to do in our time together is just look at this theme of how God is gracious What's that mean? What's that look like? That's question one. Second question is, what should we not do with God's gracious favor to us? There's some things we shouldn't do. And then what should we do? So some do's and don'ts, but we'll start with those don'ts. But what is God's favor? What are we talking about? So I want to invite you to Exodus 34. I actually want to pick it up in verse 1 just to get some context. So this is Exodus 34, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones, and I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke, symbolized how they had broken the covenant. Be ready in the morning, then come on up on Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. No one is to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain. Not even the flocks and herds may graze in front of the mountain. Verse 4, so Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones, and went up Mount Sinai early in the morning, as the Lord had commanded him. 
and he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Verse 5. <clears throat> then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name. I've been reading in my Bible a lot this, just every day, and I just noticed that the name and the name, the name. We sang about it a lot. What is God's name? Here is a good definition of God's name. His, he finally gives us his name here in verse 5 and 6. He proclaimed his name, the Lord, which means Yahweh or the God who loves you. It's a loyal love who makes covenants with his people. Verse 6, and he proclaimed, he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshiped. Lord, he said, if I have found favor in your eyes, then let the, the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. Let's pray as we continue our time in the word. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we worship you. You are compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, and we lean into you now. Open our eyes to the truth of your word. Lord, we ask that you remove any obstacles, barriers, anything that's drawing us away from you so that we can come and see you and grow closer to you. Help us, we pray. Amen. The Lord is gracious. Good news. God loves us even when we don't deserve it. God's heart is still gracious. What's that mean? Another way to say it is favor. We saw it there in verse 9. Lord, if I have found favor in your eyes. Sometimes this word gracious, I'm leaning on some of the Bible Project guys. They have some podcasts and videos. If you just Google some of this with the Bible Project, it's very helpful. And one, th one time you look at this in the Old Testament, this word for gracious, it's just something that's nice to look at. It's described as a, as a deer, a graceful deer. Or there's a necklace, and they would say that's gracious or graceful. It's nice to look at. A lot of times it's describing relationships with people, that there's someone who is in a low position looking for favor from someone in a high position. Moses said that, Lord, if I have found favor in your eyes, Moses to Lord. There's also the, the widow Ruth, and she's looking for favor in the eyes of Boaz. If you've read that story, she says, if I have found favor, David finds favor in the eyes of King Saul and also in the prince Jonathan. So someone lesser looking to someone finding favor. We're going to talk more about that this summer when we get into those 200 years. And then a lot of times in the book of Esther, some of our ladies studied Esther not too long ago. And if you remember Esther's story, the first chapter, it's a beauty pageant contest. You remember she went through a year's worth of special treatment and she comes into the king and Esther finds favor in the king's eyes. He likes what he sees. So sometimes it's something that's beautiful. Other times it's given when people don't deserve it. And there was later on in Esther's story, if you remember, that evil guy Haman gets the king to, to make an edict, you know, to kill, destroy, annihilate the Jewish people. And she comes a few times and goes to the king and says, may I have favor? Spare the life of me and my people. And so sometimes this idea for favor is just asking for something that you don't deserve. It's interesting that this word for gracious that we find is 13 times in the Hebrew Bible. 11 of those 13 times, it's paired with the word we talked about last week, compassion. Compassionate and gracious. So compassion helps us understand grace. Grace helps us understand compassion. And so where that compassion was that, that womb-like, motherly, tender, parent-like love, grace is this idea that God's going to love us even when we don't deserve it. And we just need to look at the context of the story. Michael did a great job last week highlighting what was going on. I just want to kind of review that just briefly. But 
Even if you remember, God brought his people out of Egypt. They're, they're now to get these Ten Commandments. He wants to have this relationship with them. It's almost like a marriage ceremony. Exodus 19, he's like, you're my chosen people, a special possession. Exodus 20, he gives them the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. No other gods, no idols, gives them those ten words. Around Exodus 24, in unison, the people say in one voice, everything the Lord has said we will do. What's that sound like at a wedding ceremony? Will you have this person? If so, answer, I do. Everything the Lord says we will do. That's Exodus 24. You get to Exodus 32, just a few chapters later. God, Moses has gone up to the, the mountain to be with God 40 days. In fact, I always figured this out. The Bible Project guys were helpful in this. They're up, Moses is up on the mountain with the Lord, and he's given all these instructions about like this tent that they call the tabernacle. And they're saying, you have this table, you have this lampstand, you get these curtains. What's it sound like? It sounds like they just have had the marriage ceremony, and now they're getting the house set up, aren't they? They're, they're getting ready to, to move in together as husband and wife. And so it's the idea that you know, God is saying, okay, when I come meet with you in the temple or in the tabernacle, we're going to have this table, we're going to have lampstands, there are going to be these curtains, and I'm going to dwell with you. And so Moses is getting these instructions up on the mountain. The people are like, what's taking him so long? As for this fellow Moses, we don't know where he is. And it's like almost before they even go on the honeymoon, they're starting to cheat on God. And they tell Aaron, make us gods for us, because we don't know what happened to this, this fella. And so they tear off their gold earrings, and Aaron's words to Moses after the fact, he's like, I put all this gold into the fire, and out came this calf. <laughs> and they've made this idol, and we'll talk more about that next week when we talk about how God is slow to anger. And that whole punishing the children and the children to the, of the sins of the parents for the third and fourth generation, we'll talk about that next week. But that's what's happening. And so they have broken this covenant. Moses throws the, the tablets. That symbolizes that this covenant is broken. And then we hear these words. What is God's name like? Go to Exodus 33, verse 12. We're going to get a little more context of, of how God how Moses says, would you please show us favor? Be gracious to us. Exodus 33, 12. Moses has been speaking to God as one speaks to a friend there in verse 11. Then Moses says to the Lord, verse 12, Exodus 33. You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know who will, whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name. You have found favor. That's the root word for our word gracious. You have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways. That's a good prayer to pray. So I may know you and continue to find favor. Would you please be gracious to me? I may find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. Verse 14, the Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Verse 15, then Moses said, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased, you have favor with us, with me and with your people, unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased. I have favor. I am gracious toward you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, show, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you. Take note of that phrase, pass in front of you. I will proclaim my name. I will call out my name. The Lord, in your presence, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock when my glory passes by. Hang on to that again. I will put you in the cleft in the rock, cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. So it's in this context of 
God's people breaking this covenant relationship with God where he says, my name, you want to know who I am? I am compassionate and gracious. I will give you my favor even when you don't deserve it. My friend, that's some good news. God, the Lord, looks with favor on us even when we don't deserve it. But let's be honest. We think we have a pretty good sense of justice, don't we? And we think we know what people deserve. If someone wrongs us, then we want God to get them, don't we? If they, if they hurt someone, then God should hurt them. We want the balances to add up and everything to be even. But that's not the story of the Bible. God loves us even when we don't deserve it. And so how do we respond? There's some unhealthy ways to respond, and Jonah gives us an example. If you know the story of Jonah, if not, I invite you to turn in your Bible. It's there on page 754. This text from Exodus 34 is the most often quoted story in the verses in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. And Jonah is given this instruction. Jo God tells Jonah, you go to Nineveh, preach against it. And Jonah's like, no way am I going there. He flees the opposite way. J Nineveh, Assyria, they were the bad boys on the block. So you can kind of just pick your scared nations right now or throughout history, the bad boys, the bad bullies on the world playground, and just kind of put them all into one. You're getting close to Assyria. They were scary guys. They, their stories were their king would take their def the, a defeated king that they'd conquered and they would peel the skin off of their king and hang it on the wall. That's those guys. And so God says, Jonah, go talk to them about me. I ain't doing that, no way. And so he gets on a boat. God persuades him. The big storm, throw, throws, he's thrown overboard, big fish, spits him out. Jonah says, okay, I will go. And he goes to Nineveh. This is, Gen this is Jonah chapter 3. And he has a sermon. He probably was pretty happy about this. 40 more days, Nineveh, and God is going to overthrow you. 40 more days, and you're going to get it. He was probably pretty excited. Finally, these bad guys are going to get what's coming to them. 40 more days, and Nineveh is going to be overthrown. Well, guess what? The king of Nineveh responds to the message. And it says that he lays off his royal robe and puts on sackcloth, the scratchy stuff, a symbol of mourning. And he says, we're fasting. The whole, everybody, humans and cows, nobody's eating, nobody's drinking, we're going to pray. Perhaps God may have mercy on us. And we pick up the story in, in Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. When God saw that what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented, and God did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. God had favor on those people of Nineveh, even then when they didn't deserve it, because they were some bad folks. Listen to Jonah's response to God's compassion. But, when, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. Let's be honest, there's a lot of us that you have a pretty strong sense of right and wrong, and when something's not right, you're angry. And that's okay, that's, a, that's, a, that's something from God. But he sees this, and he becomes angry, and he prays to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is why I tried to forestall by going to Tarshish. I went the opposite way. And then he says this, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Did you hear what Jonah prayed? He prayed back the words that God gave to Moses and the people there in Exodus on that mountain. I knew you were, and he, he actually front loads it and says, I know you're gracious, you're favorable, and compassionate, and slow to anger and abounding in love. And he is angry at the grace of God displayed on a people that he thinks does not deserve it. So we have a warning here when we see God pour out favor on people we don't think deserve it. Don't get angry. Jonah got angry at the compassion 
of God. That's warning sign number one. Warning sign number two, don't do this with the grace of God. Don't abuse the grace of God. Don't abuse it. Don't think, okay, well, if God's going to forgive me, then I can do whatever I want. Because the Apostle Paul said something about that in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Paul says, by no means. We have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Romans 6, 1 and 2. So we don't abuse the grace of God. Remember that story there by James Bryan Smith preached the same sermon and the police officer came up said thank you for telling me that God loves me without conditions and they had hugged and the police officer walks up and there was a young lady waiting to come in and she came up to him and she says your sermon was so freeing about how God loves us without conditions and he was a glowing again man caught it again she said, yeah, I said, for the last six months, I've been living with my boyfriend, and I grew up in a church that said that was sin, and I kind of felt guilty about it, but I heard that you said, God loves me without any condition, so now I feel good. It's okay. And he thought, oh my, I kind of missed the mark there. And it's true that God does love us without any conditions. He loves us even when we don't deserve it, but he was able to talk with her a few months later said, hey, you know, our sexuality is a gift from God and it's reserved for a husband and a wife in the beautiful context of marriage and we just can't give ourselves away. And she was like, but I think if my boyfriend, if, if we kind of save ourselves, I think he's going to leave me because I think he's just interested in me for my body. And he said, well, you need to just tell him. We're going to wait till we get married. And she actually took his advice. And she said, you know what? He left me. He left me for good. And then a couple years later, she came back with a ring on her finger to that same preacher. And she said, guess what? I found a man and he loves me. We're going to wait to be married. He loves me. And James Bryan Smith just thought, you know what? Maybe it does start with God's grace first. Maybe we have to hear the words that God loves us before we have to take that step to change. And some people say God's first word and his last word is grace. He loves us even when we don't deserve it. But we can't be angry when God gives us favor, but we also cannot abuse God's favor. And we'll talk more about that next week, about the holiness of God and how God is slow to anger and there is punishment for sin, but we still have a response to receive that gift, and while God's grace is free, it is not cheap. It came at the price of his one and only son who lived a sinless life, died on a cross to take away our sin. And so what do we do with God's favor? How do we respond to God's favor. I want to take you to the gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 6, verse 48. Jesus sends his disciples out on the Sea of Galilee. And it's nighttime and they're straining at the oars. And Jesus comes walking on the water. And here's how Mark describes it. He comes out to them walking on the water and he was about to pass by them. Why would Mark write that Jesus is walking on the water? Was he trying to, is Jesus trying to outrun them to the other side? What's going on here? He was about to pass by them. Do you remember what we read in Exodus? Moses, you want to see my glory? Stand right there in the rock, and I will pass by. I'll cover you with my hand. You, when I pass by, you can see my backside. That phrase for pass by could be Bible talk for saying God is here. And so God shows up there on the Sea of Galilee that night in Jesus, and he uh, gets their attention. They're like, someone special here. This is the Son of God. 
And then later on, Jesus is walking again through Jericho. In Mark chapter 10, there's this blind man by the name of Bartimaeus, and he hears that Jesus is coming by. And in Mark 10, 46, Jesus is walking through. Bartimaeus shouts out, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus, son of God, have mercy on me. That's the New Testament word for be gracious. Have favor. Someone lesser, blind guy, Jesus, son of David, you're a king. Have mercy on me. The people around him, hey, say, be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Look with favor on me. And so they, they called him. Jesus says, hey, call him over here. Verse 49, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet, came to Jesus. Verse 51, Mark chapter 10, what do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus comes to give us his mercy, to give us his grace, to show us his favor, even when we don't deserve it. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Ephesians chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, one last text. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and following. Ephesians 2, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God loves us even when we don't deserve it. So where do we go from here? Many of us just need to be reminded that God loves you. God loves you more than you can even know. And so maybe we just need to hear that. Maybe you've just thought, you know, God just doesn't like me. God loves you. And so hear that, that to just be reminded of God's grace and compassion. And maybe you need to receive that gift today and say, okay, I need to take that next step of, of saying, okay, Jesus, you're my Lord, you're my Savior, I, you're, you're my King, and I need to take that next step. So if that's you today, I want to invite you to come talk before you leave. And Maybe you've never taken that step into baptism. That's another way to say, Jesus, I'm receiving you as my king, my savior. But it's a gift, so maybe you need to receive that or just be reminded that God loves you. Maybe you need to rejoice with someone who's experiencing God's favor even though you don't think they deserve it. Maybe we just need to be happy and thankful that God's being kind to someone even though they don't deserve it and recognize that it's a gift from God. And third, all of us need to extend God's favor to those who don't deserve it. There's a cultural term out there now called the hollowing of the middle. People are angry on both sides of whatever debate it is. And there's algorithms that feed you to see and hear all of your own point of view and, and to demonize the other point of view. It doesn't matter where you are. And, and the, the consensus in the middle is just kind of hollowed out. And it's just very uh, aggressive on both sides of whatever debate, topic, question you're on. And so maybe we need to stop treating everyone like they're the enemy we live in angry and anxious times. What would it look like to extend God's favor to someone who opposes your opinions, your viewpoints, 
How can God show, how can you show God's grace and compassion to your neighbor this week? Remember, God, the Lord, the Lord looks with favor on us even when we don't deserve it. And my friends, that is good news. Good news. Before we conclude today, I want to give a couple instructions on upcoming events and uh, this afternoon specifically. One is a parent-child dedication on May 12th. That'll be Mother's Day. And so if you're interested in participating in that, uh, there will be a class on May 5th. And so if you'd like to participate, you can text that word dedication to our text number, 833-612-9972. And so what's going to happen is we're going to have some parents and, and their kids, and we want to have a formal way to say that these uh, families want to raise their families in the ways of Jesus. It's not a salvation thing. We're not imparting any salvation. But it's a formal way for moms and dads to say, we want to raise our kids in the ways of Jesus, and we want our church family to come alongside of us and walk through that. And so moms and dads, if you want to participate, you can, there's sign-up sheet in the lobby. You can also text us that word dedication. Uh, there'll also be a class uh, on May 5th right after worship where we can just talk about godly parenting, Christ-centered families, things like that. So take advantage of that. Moms and dads, uh, you can also, we encourage you to find a prayer partner. So seek someone out in this church family. Say, will you be our prayer partner for this experience? Uh, and so we'd love for that person to join join on that class as well to be part of that and so i recognize sometimes mother's day is a difficult day uh, but at the same time we also want to recognize our families and every one of us is part of this family of god and so you know married single you know widowed different situations in life i recognize there's hard but we all have a part to play we are the family of god this church and so uh, we're hoping that that'll be a special moment for our church family to say, we are here helping raise these kids in the ways of Jesus. So if that's something you'd like to participate in, uh, you can text or sign up uh, and get with Michael if you have more questions on that. Uh, also, Lake Springfield Christian Assembly is our mission, uh, kind of our quarterly mission project. And so they've got a work day, a serve day next Saturday out there. Uh, so if you'd like to participate in that service day, uh, go on out there. Uh, they've always got yummy cinnamon rolls. They feed you lunch. And there's kind of projects for all types of school things. We're actually working on some other details that we'll be communicating when we know some more on some other specific projects uh, that we may go out and, and take care of as well. So uh, we want to remember, remember, celebrate, and serve at our, our bicentennial year. And so that'll be one of the um, serve opportunities. And then final instructions for our walk today, okay? You guys ready for your, your our bicentennial walk? We want to celebrate this. I'm really excited. Uh, I want to give credit to Trina Claire. She picked today for our, for our walk day. Did she do a good job or what? Yeah, fine job, uh, Trina. So uh, we picked that months ago with the hope that weather will cooperate, so it looks like it will. So what that's going to look like here, um, I'm just going to read my instructions so I get it all right. Uh, we invite you to participate whatever form you're able to do. Some of you are going to walk it, hike it, run it, whatever you want to do is fine. Uh, and some of you are like, I'll just do the auto tour. That's totally fine. Whatever you want to do, we want you to be part of it. Uh, you can meet us out there at the original site. Uh, it's about a two-minute walk, probably from where you parked your car to where that boundary, that memorial stone is. We'll have about a five to ten minute little devotional historical moment. I'll lead at that. Um, if, if technology cooperates, we'll record that and, and actually Facebook Live it so you can see that later on uh, or watch it live if you want to, if technology cooperates. Uh, so that'll be uh, that. And then um, we have the path marked out. Uh, there'll be some signs with scriptures, with some prayer ideas. So the, the idea is for this to be a, a prayer event that you walk with, with our people uh, with your family, however you want to, whatever pace you want to, and read the scripture and pray. Or there might be some historical information about a preacher or the history of the church and things like that. So there'll be some markers like that. Also, the route will be marked with white flags, okay? What color are the flags? 
white. Look for the white flags. You stay between Spring Creek and the old Jacksonville Road and keep coming east. You should not get lost. Okay? Don't cross the creek. Don't cross the old Jack. And you come this way. Keep the sun at your back. You'll be in good shape. Okay? Um, we'll have water available at Helen's house. Uh, so we got a water stop available. Pick up any sticks you see for Helen and thankful for her cooperation and kindness. Uh, we will go to this, the Berlin Cemetery. There will be a sign at a, at a headstone for John Bolton. Look for John and Sarah Bolton. There will be a sign there. Uh, you can have that prayer prompt there. And then go to the Country Kids Learning Center, which was the home of Berlin Christian Church for 150 years. Uh, and so go up the front steps where that big red door is, so the big steps that face the old Jacksonville Road. Go in there. Uh, ring the bell, read, read a scripture, have a prayer. Um, that should be fun. In the event you need a restroom, they've graciously said you can use the restrooms there, so we're thankful for that. I don't think you'll track in any mud, but just be mindful of that, so we won't want to mess up their space, okay? So go up the front steps. What steps are you going to go up? The front steps, uh, the red door, ring the bell, and then here's the hardest part of the day. I'd like for you to wait. Wait for us to come as a group so that we can safely come from there to here with a Sangamon County deputy who's going to lead the way, and we've got some other things. If you need a van ride, we've got some van transportation too, uh, but we'd like to do that safely as a group so we don't get anybody to run over today. I really don't want anybody to get hurt today, okay? So just hang out. If you're bored, go back to the cemetery and check some things out. It's a beautiful day, uh, but when you see me, I'm going to bring up the rear. Uh, then we'll be ready to come here. We've got sandwiches and lunch stuff, so come uh, back here. We'll have meat for lunch. We've got another sign here as you come in, okay? So I'll repeat a lot of that back there because some of us just need more than one reminder on some of that. So I'm looking forward to that, uh, and my prayer is that as we walk through this experience, that we don't just, you know, have a nice day outside, but that we really connect with our roots as a church and that God will renew our vision. And so I'm excited to just as we celebrate God's faithfulness here, okay? Let me read our scripture theme, and then we will sing. Uh, one other thing, uh, Chris Mueller, wherever Chris is, will have the big white van. So I'd say, Chris, you're in, go ahead and get in motion, get the van ready. Uh, so the big white van will take whoever wants to. Uh, you can take your car there. Uh, we've got, there's parking, but... Uh, if we can get some people to go there without cars, that would be nice because you're going to be back here where your car is. After we get back here, we'll run the vans back to get your cars if your cars are there and you are here. Does that make sense? So the white van uh, will take you. Uh, and so basically, go to the Pleasant Plains Road, turn right, and when you see those grain silos, just drive straight into that, that drive. If you cross Spring Creek, you've gone too far. Okay? All right. So here's our, our verse for the, the theme I want to talk about. I'll read again one more time. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. And God passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And then verse 7. Maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. And if that last part kind of scares you and confuses you, you come back next week and we'll talk more about that. Let's stand and sing. I believe you give sight to the blind. I believe that the dead came to life. I believe there were wonders and signs, and you're still the same. I believe every word that you said. I believe there are scars in your hands, that your goodness is good without end, and you'll never change. tell of your wonders, sing of your grace. The God of creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always, always. Your mercy is mighty. 
age after age, all generations will bow down and praise. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always, always. I believe you will come in the clouds. I believe you are here even now. Then your presence, I know there is power. Power to save, oh, I will tell of your wonders, sing of your grace, the God of creation knows me by name, the Lord is faithful, yesterday, now, and always, always, your mercy is mighty, age after age, and all generations will bow down and praise the Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always, always. You are, you are, you always will be God. You are, you are, you always will be God. Yes, you always will tell of your wonders and sing of your grace the god of creation he knows me by name the lord is faithful yesterday now and always always your mercy is mighty age after age and all generations will bow down and praise the lord is faithful yesterday now and always always you are you are you are you always will be god yes you are you are you are you, are, you always will be god yes you always will be god your mercy is mighty age after age and all generations will bow down and praise the lord is faithful yesterday now and always